So now that we've decided that linear subspaces are what we want to focus our attention on, we'd like to figure out how to use the tools of linear algebra to describe a linear subspace by using a matrix. We're going to do that by going backwards. The typical linear algebra problem gives you a matrix and asks you, what is the column space, the range of this matrix? We want to go backwards. Given a subspace S, we want to find a matrix A of which S is the column space. Well, how do we do it? Let's start by illustrating this example. I'm going to take the vector space R2 and the subspace inside of it consisting of the points for which y is equal to 2x. You can convince yourself that this is a linear subspace, in fact. So how are we going to find a matrix A of which S is the column space? Well, recall that a linear transformation from one vector space to another vector space is what we represent with a matrix. And if the codomain of our matrix A is R2 and the range of A is S, the column space in other words, then what we'd like to do is cast R2 as the range of this, uh, sorry, the codomain of this linear transformation and then decide what the domain should be. Well, how we're going to do that is because our column space here is one dimensional, we know that our domain has to at least be one dimensional in order to make this all work, in order to have enough different vectors back in the domain to be able to span all of the different vectors in the column space, the range. So what we can do to get this process started is observe, first of all, that if A represents a linear transformation whose domain is the set of real numbers and whose codomain is, this, is R2, the xy plane, that means that A will be a matrix that has one column and two rows. So what is that column, or what are those rows? We can figure that out by choosing a vector inside of our column space. So I'm just going to pick at random, say the vector 3, 6. You can convince yourself this belongs to s because 6 is equal to 2 times 3, so it satisfies y equals 2x. We know that this vector, because it's part of the range of this linear transformation, has to have come from some vector x back in the domain. In other words, a times some x has to be equal to 3, 6. Now we have a lot of freedom. Specifically, we have freedom in how to pick which x this 3, 6 actually came from. So let's make things easier on ourselves and, and declare that 3, 6, the vector we chose in S, came from the result of multiplying A by the number 1 in the domain. Here the domain is a set of real numbers. And that's an easy choice to make because A times 1 is just equal to A itself. But then that means that the matrix A is itself equal to the column vector 3, 6. So this looks a little bit weird at first. but because 3, 6 is a vector which spans our subspace S. That means that the matrix, which is a one column, two row matrix, whose column is 3, 6 itself, that matrix, as a linear transformation from R into R2, has as its range, or its column space, the line y equals 2x. OK, so that was a relatively simple example. Let's see what happens when we go up a dimension. So here I'm going to take my codomain to be the xyz space, R3, and our subspace to be the set of points xyz inside of R3, such that x minus y plus z is equal to 0. You can convince yourself that this is, in fact, a linear subspace. OK, so if I want to find a matrix A of which S is the range, I'm going to start by, first of all, giving myself enough room in my domain to make it work. Because we think of a plane as being a two-dimensional object, we should have a domain that has at least two dimensions for us to play with. So let's start with the domain being the xy plane. If that's the case, then A represents a linear transformation from R2 into R3. And therefore, the matrix A will have two columns and three rows. Let's figure out what those columns should be. Well, because we want S to be the column space of A, that means that our columns of the matrix A have to span the set S. So let's start by choosing any old column, any old vector that belongs to S. I can do that by just finding any x, y, and z which satisfy the equation x minus y plus z is equal to 0. Let's pick 1, 1, 0, for example. I'm going to call that vector v. And because it belongs to the range of this linear transformation, that must mean that there is some x for which v is equal to ax, where that x comes from our domain, our xy plane on the left-hand side. OK, so what should that vector x be? Again, we get some latitude in how to choose it. Let's choose it to make our lives easy. We're going to choose x 
to be the nice, friendly, first standard basis vector 1, 0. So that A, the matrix which we don't know yet, multiplied by the vector 1, 0, is going to give us the vector V, 1, 1, 0. Likewise, to keep the process going, we'll pick a second vector, call it W, again by picking a different combination of x, y's, and z's, different meaning linearly independent here, and figure out that if W belongs to the column space, then that must mean W is equal to A times Y for some vector Y that was in our domain. And again, we get some latitude in how to pick Y. So we're going to pick Y to be, first of all, linearly independent from X, but also try to make our lives as easy as possible. Let's pick Y to be something simple, like the second standard basis vector, 0, 1. So that A times 0, 1 gives us the vector W, 0, 1, 1. Well, OK, now we have two characteristics that should tell us something about the matrix A. We know what happens when we multiply A by the first standard basis vector, we should get 1, 1, 0. And when we multiply A by the second standard basis vector, we should get 0, 1, 1. So what does that mean A is? We can figure that out because multiplying a matrix by a standard basis vector does nothing but extract one of the columns out of that matrix. In other words, what is A times 1, 0? But in fact, exactly the first column of the matrix A. Therefore, the first column of the matrix A should be equal to V itself. Likewise, if I multiply any matrix by the second standard basis vector, I get the second column of that matrix. So in other words, the first column of the matrix A should be V110 itself. And the second column of the matrix A should be W011. Therefore, finding a matrix of which a given subspace is the column space is as straightforward as, first of all, finding a basis, in other words, a linearly independent set of vectors which spans that set and then taking those basis vectors and just making them the columns of the matrix. So it's not a super involved process. Just find a basis for S and then use those basis vectors as the columns of the matrix A. All right, so now that we know how to do that, we want to push it a step further. Because what we were just talking about, we we're talking about column spaces and solving AX equals B, we were thinking about linear systems which were consistent. The problem of the projection is that by its very nature, the projection problem leads to an inconsistent system of equations. Let's illustrate that by way of example by choosing the subspace uh, in R2, which satisfies y equals minus 2x. So this is this line with a slope of negative 2 passing through the origin. And choosing a point which is not a part of that column space. So let's pick 210, for example. It's not too hard to see why 210 does not belong to the set S. And so the question is, can we use linear algebra to find the point on the red line, the space S, which is closest in Euclidean distance to the point B, which is not on S? And we first observe that no matter how hard we try, if I set up a linear transformation A, uh, a matrix of which S is the column space, we can do that again by just choosing some basis of S, let's say minus 2, 4. We only need one vector for a basis for this space because it's a one-dimensional subspace and making that the column of our matrix. So A is the matrix minus 2, 4. And observing that choosing different values of x in the domain are going to give me different values of Ax in the column space, or the range. For example, if I pick x equal to 1 in my domain, then A times 1 is going to give me negative 2, 4, which is a part of S. If x is 2, I'm going to get a different point inside of S. If x is negative 1 half, I get a different point inside of S. But by definition, any x that I pick back from this domain, when I multiply it by a, I necessarily get a point which is inside of s, the column space of a. So all of my points that I'm getting have to land on my red line. I'm never going to get b itself, 210, because it's off of the line. We can see that with algebra. Just setting up the linear system minus 2, 4 times x equals 210, rewriting this uh, out of matrix vector form and just into equation form, gives me two equations, negative 2x equals 2 and 4x equals 10. I can solve those using fifth grade algebra, dividing by negative 2. I find the first equation tells me x needs to be negative 1. The second equation tells me x has to be 5 halves, and those two conflict with one another. So there is no solution. There is no x that I can choose for which ax is going to give me b, 210. So I necessarily have an inconsistent system here. The question is, how can linear algebra help us not to hit B on the nose with AX, but to get as close to B as we can possibly get within S? That, after all, is the question of projection. 
So the perhaps surprising answer to this question is we're going to make the equation solvable by making it smaller through a technique that I call dimension reduction. Here's how it works. Here's our insolvable original uh, system of equations, right? Ax equals b, where b is 210, a is the vector, the matrix, negative 2, 4, and therefore the column space of A, the range of A, in other words, consists of just the points on the red line. So I can't actually get to B by multiplying A times X. So this is a system that I cannot solve. AX cannot equal B in this example. But heuristically, what I like to think of here is that the reason we can't solve this is that there's too much space. Uh, over in my co-domain, right? I have this whole two-dimensional xy plane that b could belong to, but ax can only belong to this one-dimensional subspace in this example. So there's too much freedom for us to miss the point b. Maybe we can do better if we take the number of dimensions in the co-domain and we collapse them down. If I can somehow reduce my co-domain from two-dimensional down to one-dimensional without ruining anything about my domain, then maybe we'll have a shot at this. And here's how we're going to do it. We're going to take the equation ax equals b, and we're going to multiply both sides of this equation by something which has the power to shrink b, which in the beginning was a 2 by 1 column vector. I want to shrink that down to something which is 1 by 1 instead of 2 by 1. In order to do that with matrix multiplication, I need to multiply both sides of this equation by a matrix which is 1 by 2. And the 1 by 2 matrix we're going to use to do this is the transpose of the matrix A. Transposes are something we learn about in linear algebra, but I don't feel like they really very well motivated the first time we meet them. Transposes are going to be a constant presence in our applied math course this semester, so this is our introduction to some of the magic that a transpose can work. Let's multiply both sides of this equation, which we can't solve, by a transpose. So my new equation, a transpose ax equals a transpose b, is hopefully going to do a little bit better. What is a transpose? Well, if a is the matrix negative 2, 4, then a transpose, because a was a 2 by 1 matrix, is going to be a 1 by 2 matrix obtained by swapping the columns of a with the rows. So just turning a on its side. A transpose is negative 2, 4, written as a row matrix instead of as a column matrix. And sure enough, that's 1 by 2. So that if I multiply a transpose by a, and when I multiply a transpose by b, in both of those examples, we're getting 1 by 2 matrix multiplied by 2 by 1 matrix. That's going to give me a 1 by 1 matrix. A 1 by 1 matrix is a single real number. So already, I feel like this is going to be a much simpler system of equations to work with than the one that we started with. Pictorially, what's happening? Well, now, both our domain and our codomain turn out to be one-dimensional. x which is my unknown on the left-hand side of the equation in both cases, still belongs to this one-dimensional just uh, real line. right? But now on the right-hand side, A transpose B, which is the target, it's the thing we're trying to hit, now belongs to also a one-dimensional space. So now we don't have too much room in our codomain such that we have the luxury of missing B the way that we do on the left-hand side of the screen. So the tempting conclusion is that this must be a consistent system of equations because we don't have any room to miss a transpose b. And so some x has to hit a transpose b. So we should be able to solve the equation on the right, even though we couldn't solve the equation on the left. The even better news is that the x which we have in the equation on the right is exactly the same thing as the x that we have in the equation on the left. So if I can solve the equation on the right side of this screen, Hopefully that will tell me something about the unsolvable equation on the left side of the screen. Let's test it out and see what happens. So if a transpose is minus 2, 4, I'm just going to compute the matrix product, minus 2, 4 times minus 2, 4, the first uh, column and the second, uh, sorry, the first row is second as a column. Remembering how to multiply matrices, just going across the row and down the column, we'll get negative 2 times negative 2 plus 4 times 4. That's 4 plus 16. Again, a 1 by 1 matrix is just a single real number, specifically 20. And then on the right-hand side, A transpose B, multiplying across the row and down the column, gives me negative 2 times 2 plus 4 times 10. That's negative 4 plus 40, or 36. And now I have a, again, fifth grade algebra equation to solve. Divide both sides by 20. I find out that x is 36 divided by 20. In the decimal, that's 1.8. So we find out that when we solve this equation on the right, which we actually can find a solution for, which is already kind of surprising, we get the number x equals 1.8. And the $64,000 question is, what does that number tell us about the question that's on the left side of the screen? 
Well, to figure that out, remember that 1.8 still lives in the domain of the question that, that we're trying to solve on the left-hand side. So 1.8 is not our point on the subspace s. But what could be a point on the subspace s is a times that vector, a times 1.8. So what is a times 1.8? We'll just multiply the matrix a by 1.8, and we'll get negative 3.6, 7.2. So that is a point in S. That's a point on our subspace that maybe we're going to be able to project onto. And the question we'd love to answer is, is that point the projection that we're looking for? To answer that question, let's just actually connect that point to B. If I connect that point to B, then well, just using, again, uh, basic algebra, we can find what the slope of that line segment is. The rise is 10 minus 7.2, that's 2.8. The run is 2 minus negative 3.6, that's 5.6. Dividing the former by the latter, rise over run, gives me actually 1 half as the slope of that line segment. Meanwhile, S itself is a line with a slope of negative 2. And we observe that the slopes are opposite reciprocals. Therefore, this line segment that joins my point, negative 3.6, 7.2, to the point B, 210, is actually perpendicular to S, my subspace, which was something that we were hoping the projection would satisfy. And sure enough, again, using the principles of Euclidean geometry, the fact that these two lines are parallel means that if I draw a circle which is centered at B and which passes through the point AX, negative 3.6, 7.2, then that circle is going to be tangent to the line S. And if it's tangent, that means it happens to be the circle of smallest radius which intersects S and which is centered at B. Therefore, this distance achieves the shortest distance between S and the point B, and therefore our point is the point in S which is closest to B. And therefore, negative 3.6, 7.2 is in fact the projection of B onto S. So this is something that should be very surprising. We couldn't solve this equation AX equals B because B didn't belong to the column space of A. But yet, if we multiply both sides of that same equation by a transpose, we got an equation which we could solve. And when we solved that equation, we didn't get something which lands on b, but we did get something, 1.h, which gets us as close to b as possible among the elements of the column space of a. This is not an accident but it's something which we're going to tease out over the course of the next few weeks to figure out why this works and how we can make the same phenomenon work in other contexts that can help us to understand how this process of projection tells us something about applied mathematics.